we've talked about it already. Halloween's right around the corner. I'm excited about that myself because Halloween means uh, an opportunity to go when others won't go. And uh, I, I want us to be a people and, and to hear that message. I think Christ wants us to hear that message, to be a people that go when others won't go. You know, when I think of that conversation, I, I, I was taken back to 9-11. And, and I don't know if you can remember where you were September 11th, 2001, but I, I can't forget. It's one of those things where it, it was just a, a haze in the air. I mean, I, I, I'm sure it was there before those that maybe, I'm not saying anybody's age, but maybe you were there during Pearl Harbor. My, my father has a vague memory of that, you know, when that took place. And uh, it was just a, a, in the air of like sorrow that took place. You know, and I remember I was in the, the, the grocery store and I was checking out groceries. I had a, a free period. I was a senior in um, high school. Uh, Travis, do me a favor. It, yeah, perfect. Whatever you just did, you <laughs> tapped it and it shut off and it is beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. All right. He elbowed it and that was perfect timing. <laughs> that little one on the side. You're good, man. Um, but anyways, I was in high school and I had a free period in the morning and. Um, I uh, was, was working, I was making a joke with my friend, we were laughing, having a good time, why not, I'm a senior, I'm a kid, you know, and this lady who, who's kind of known in the community is kind of being crazy, I'm not going to like say that, but she was just had that rapport of just like, uh, I don't know, I won't go into it, but anyway, she came in and she goes, why are you laughing? And as a kid, I'm like, why wouldn't I be, you know, I'm just doing life, and she goes, don't you know America's attacked right now? Thousands of Americans are, are dying. And in my heart, I'm thinking like nuclear bombs and like New York's now gone and all this. And I'm like, what's happening? You know, so she leaves and I go over to my boss and I'm like, what's, what's going on? And he's like, oh, well, you know, an airplane flew into the tower. And at first, they didn't know if it was an accident. It was still kind of like in flux. They just knew other planes were missing too. And at the time, there was like 20 missing planes. I don't know if you remember that, but it ended up being four. And, and, uh, I went home, turned on the TV, and I was seeing the, the smoking First World Trade. And I sat there long enough, just in time, to see that second plane hit it. And, and I'll never forget the chaos that the commentators, whoa, the, the, the second plane, this is not an accident. And everything just went crazy. And I, I had to go to school after that stuff. I had the afternoon periods. And I went to my school, and again, a haze over the whole school. I don't even think we learned a thing that day. Every, every TV had the, 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 the news going. And um, one thing that stuck with me is that, you know, it's about 3,000, just over, was it, was it just over 3,000 that, that died on September 11th? And a very common question was, where was God in all of that? And a very common answer from even myself at that time frame was, well, he was with the other 96,000 getting out. Those buildings, there should have been about 100,000 or so people that died that day. But only 3,000 died. And I, I don't mean to desensitize that, but only 3,000 died. Well, this week I kind of looked at some of those numbers because now they have them all broken down into like where they were just regular citizens. I think there were 1,700 normal citizens. And, and, and there was over 400 first responders that had died in that moment in history. And that really stuck with me because I remember watching those news stations that as justifiably so, I'm not saying anything about anybody that ran away that day, but as thousands, hundreds, tens of thousands of people were running away from those buildings, there were some people that were running in to the building. That when the cries of help were going on, they responded and said, this is our training, this is my call, I will go while others run away, I will go. It's always stuck with me. And this Boston bombing, about, is that like two years ago now? It's been a while, but when those two bombs went off in the Boston Marathon. I, I remember watching those videos too, and there was one particular moment in the, the marathon where these Marines, about 10 or 15 of them, have run the entirety of the Boston Marathon. And they had run through that section where the bombs were about to go off. And they had just finished the race. And they were exhausted when those two bombs went off. And 
while everybody, justifiably so, was running away, the Marines were the first ones that were running back in. I read this news article from one of the Marines, and it almost got me crying because, because he goes, he says, we understand why people run, but we're the Marines, and we are trained that when somebody says help, we help. And I went, hey, <laughs> I'm glad they're on my team, you know. Well, well Christians today, I, I want to tell you today, you are first responders. There is a world out there. I'm not talking 9-11. I'm not talking Boston bombings. But I am talking about a world that's crying out for help. And we are the first responders, responders to them. To tell them the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Halloween's just one of those opportunities to do that. Uh, I want to talk about a passage of scripture, Matthew chapter 8, 23 through 27. Uh, about a time where the disciples were in a dark moment. Now, this isn't a, a dark moment. You can just give me one second, I'll explain this. You can, you can hit the up arrow button. Good man. <laughs> so much grace, Travis. Thank you for helping me. <laughs> Um, they're, they're in a, a dark moment. It's not a dark moment, though, where it's like 9-11. It, it's, it's not like a kid's dying of cancer here. It's just a, a dark time that the disciples actually got to this place of so much fear that they actually thought they themselves would die. Now, a lot of humans can kind of substitute themselves into this thought that these disciples are going through. And, and in this text, there's three responses to the one emotion of fear. That the disciples give. And I want to talk about those three responses today. Um, for us to kind of look at. And, and, and talk about. Because guys you're, you're going to go through some junk in life. I'm not, I'm not bringing up anything new. Amen. You're going you're gonna to go through some junk. Some really tough stuff. Maybe, maybe not like 9-11 type stuff. But stuff that's definitely going to put your faith to the test. And... This kind of sermon is meant to encourage you today to look at those, those, those tough times as opportunities to be better, to grow, to become. But let's, let's read the text. It is on the screen behind you. Thank you, Travis. You throw me up that. It's Matthew chapter 8, starting verse 23. It says, Then he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But, well, Jesus, he was sleeping. The disciples went and they woke him up saying, Lord, save us. We're going to die. We're going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? And then he got up and he rebuked the wind and the waves and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and they asked, what kind of a man is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Now again, the, the situation, you can throw the next slide for me, brother. Um, the situation that, that we're kind of throwing out here today isn't exactly a 9-11 situation. I mean, this is just a, a boat of water, a boat that's in some water and it's being tossed a little bit and they're fearing for their lives. But you do kind of have to put yourselves into the shoes of the disciples at that time frame. Uh, again, they're, they're in the boat and they're, they're, Jesus just got done healing a miraculous amount of people in the text. And so ministry is going good. Not, not all the disciples are called yet, but those who are there, man, ministry is good. And Jesus is like, let's, let's go to the other side. The, the other side of the lake, the Sea of Galilee, and let's go do ministry over there. And they they probably you can imagine they all get in the boat and they're like, yeah, this is a good day, you know. And 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 one thing about the Sea of Galilee is that it's 600 feet below sea level. And, and what's so remarkable about that, and that even to this day, the Sea of Galilee has some phenomenal weather experiences to this day on it. And what happens, and I don't want to explain weather to you, but then the warm weather comes off the ocean line, coastline like that, and it hits that really steep drop to that 600 feet Sea of Galilee, and that friction will go so intense that there are some storms that take place on the Sea of Galilee that you just don't find on other lakes because of how low it is in world. Okay, so think about this as the disciples are all excited and they're just doing their life and all of a sudden you, you hear that in the distance. 
Now, now friends, uh, how many of you have lived out east? Really far out east? Yeah, okay. The thing about out east is that they have a different concept in terms of uh, uh, tornadoes than I think Wyoming. Now, you've seen tornadoes. Has Paul ever had a tornado? A couple uh, times? Maybe? Cody had one this summer. Okay, so there's tornadoes here. You get that. I didn't quite understand tornadoes, though, until I went to Tornado Alley. <laughs> we went from a state that had an average of like, a, they said 100 a year, and I was like, it must be like cornfields or something like that, to a state that had over 900 in a given year. And I went, whoa, we're not in Kansas anymore total. And I remember the first storm in Indiana, I was, it was like 3 a.m. And I'm, I'm in this, in my room, I'm looking out the window and I'm seeing, I'm hearing the lighting. It sounds like the house is about to fall over. And I'm looking in the distance and I'm seeing this thing called power flashes. You know what those are. There's a tornado over there. I didn't tell you because I didn't want to scare you. <laughs> oh, okay. And then all of there, it's just going like crazy out in the fields. I'm looking at my wife going, I'm scared. <laughs> Different kind of scared than what we see today, but it was new. It was shock. It was awe to me. And the disciples obviously knew that about the Sea of Galilee. They, they, they grew up there. They, they knew that it had this potential. They're out there and they hear that first thunder sound and they go, uh-oh. They know what that means. Then they feel the first gust of wind, a little spray from the rain, and the boat starts to do one of these. And all of a sudden, their joy turns to, to smiles, to, what are we going to do? It picks up a little bit more, and the boat's now tossing it, and it's maybe going here and there, and, 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 and all of a sudden, they scream out in fear. And the thing about this storm is that the disciples didn't expect it. They didn't see it coming. They, they, they would, if they saw the storm coming, they would have probably said something to Jesus. When, when, when Jesus was told to go down and, and get Lazarus raised back to life and all that good stuff, there was, the disciples were like, no, Jesus, if we go there, we're going to die. If they saw the fear, they would have made it known to Jesus. In our text, they don't see that. They, this, this, moment, this dark moment came when they least expected. But you know what? That's how Satan does it. He, he likes hitting you when you least expect expect it or you least need it. He just knows you. He knows what you struggle with. He knows what's going to cause you to cry. And the God of all order allows it to happen because he knows what ultimately will grow you the most in the end. So he targets the weak moments. He targets the frailty of your lives. And that's what's happening in the text. This fear arises out of nowhere. And the first reaction that they have is they, they wake Jesus up. He's been staring at it for a while, but they take him, you can imagine, like, Jesus! Save us! We're about to die! Now, I, I'm not trying to preach a sermon. I don't want you to hear this out of this sermon today. That when times get hard, that we can't go to Jesus. He wants you to. When times do get hard, He wants you to go to Him in prayer. But you see, there's a difference between going to Jesus in prayer with faith and going to Jesus in prayer because you've been conquered in lack of faith. See, that's what happens in the text. They wake him up. And I don't think Jesus, he gets up in his first words, he's like, how, how dare you woke me up for something so stupid? How dare you? You have such a lack of faith. He rebukes the disciples with their lack of faith. And he, he does that not because he didn't want them talking to him. He does that because he sees that they're talking to him because the fear became the bigger God in the boat than the God that was already in the boat. And he gets on them for that. He reminds them that, hey guys, I'm still in the boat. And as long as I'm in the boat, it doesn't matter how stormy it gets out there. It doesn't matter how dark of a situation you go through. I'm still in the boat. Do they still do kids camp up above Lander right there? Do they? Awesome. When I was there as a kid, um, but Bud Hampton passed down Lander for a long time. We used to bring the boats up there. and We'd get in the boats and we'd, we'd go canoeing. It was so much fun. 
And I remember one particular time, I was out on my canoe, and, and I had one of the counselors in the back, and he was doing the steering, I think, I don't know. But there was a kid in the middle as well. And all of a sudden, the wind picked up stronger than I've ever seen, being in a, a, a canoe myself. And I'm just going to town trying to paddle this thing back, and so is the counselor. He's screaming at me. He's like, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna crash. And he's kind of... I don't know who he is, so maybe I, it's nothing nobody that you know. But, but anyways, he was scaring me to death. He was freaking me out. We're going to die. He's screaming it back there, and I'm going, calm down. And I'm like seven. I'm like, we're gonna, and even if we go to the far side of the lake, we just have to walk it around. We'll be okay. <laughs> the uh, wind, though, for every paddle would take us 10 feet further out. And we were like 300 yards from where we needed to be. And the kid in the middle decides to jump out. <laughs> he had a life vest on, but still. Decides to jump out and swim to shore. We kept an eye on him because, well, he didn't make it. The counselors had to get in a canoe and go get it. And it, I, the thing that that kid reminded me of in this illustration is that he put his faith in the stormy waters rather than a boat that was still relatively dry, safe, and I believe Jesus was in it. See, you, Jesus gives you that option today to abandon ship at the quickest sign of a stormy situation. You have that right today. But I want to encourage you today as a pastor that, that it's not any better outside of the boat. At least in the boat, Jesus is there. And as long as he's there, he'll keep it together. I want us to be reminded of that, that go to him in prayer. But have faith in what he's doing through the situation to grow you, to test you, and to help you become. They're still sensing fear. Go ahead and throw this next slide from Travis. And the next thing that they do is that they scream out, Lord, save us! <laughs> they screamed out for a savior. Now, that's, that's, again, I'm not trying to preach a sermon today that says you don't need a Savior. I'm not. If you hear that today, then you're not listening. <laughs> you need a Savior from the sin death. You need Jesus in your life to help you get this thing done. You, you, you need Him to help you with the sin struggle. But see, you got to finish the sentence. <laughs> because they go, Jesus, save us because we're about to die. And the reason that Jesus responds the way he does, why are you waking me up with this? You, you have such little faith. Is he looks at them and he says, don't you know? I, I am the God that holds death in the palm of my hand. My, my daddy in heaven, the triune effect here, holds death in his hand. In other words, he was looking at them and saying, Friends, you will not die today unless God allows it. Now, now friends, that, that should give you some sense of relief today. It really should. Let me just encourage us. When, when you live your life with Jesus in the boat, let me just encourage you today. You will not, you cannot die unless God allows you to die. That should live you to cause you to live pretty fearlessly. Because I know there's some pretty awesome stories in the Bible of people that lived that way. Let me just spell out a few Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They walked through flames. I don't suggest you go try that. But they walked through flames. And God was like, it's not your time to die. Therefore, you will survive. Paul the island of Patmos, several times in his career, but I like that island of Patmos. A viper. You ever been bit by a rattler? Neither have I. Wouldn't be fun. Hanging off of his arm, dangling, he shakes it off into the fire, and he doesn't die from the venom, and they actually call him a god because of it. You can get bit by poisonous venom mistakes, and if it's not your time, you will not die. I love that. Live your life fearlessly. Knowing, knowing that he has your timing in the palm of his hands. 
But let me get real with you real quick. His timing might be that that dark thing that you're getting into might actually kill you. It might actually take your life. And as we talked about last Sunday, I don't mean to be dis, not you know desensitive toward unsensitive toward death, but so what? <laughs> so what if if that thing killed you? If you lived your life with Jesus in the boat, that means you're going to heaven. And, and as we talked about last Sunday, remind yourself heaven is better than this world could ever possibly be. So don't fear death. Because even if you did die with Jesus in the boat, you're going to hell. We talked about that description. It is simply good. But have faith today to know that He knows about every situation you'll go through. He knows the stuff that might kill you or not. It's in the palm of His hands as this next point reminds us of that the very next reaction that the disciples have to this fear emotion is that they were amazed. Okay? Because Jesus stands up, he rebukes the faith, he's like, you a little faith, come on. And I can't help but think he just kind of does one of these shh. Shh. And the waves are like, oh, okay. The wind's like, the lightning just pulls back. Shh. Be still. And the disciples, it says that they sit back, and I can't help but they just kind of go, Did you see that? They were amazed. They said, oh, That's amazing. That was amazing. The wind and the waves obey this guy, and that means that circumstances obey him, death obeys him, Satan obeys him, evil has to obey him. They were amazed. Friends, that's, that's actually what I want you to be today with life. I want you to be amazed at God. Even in the darkest and, and dirtiest and low situations that you're going to go through. Be amazed at what he's going to do in those moments. You don't believe me? Let me get personal with my life really quick. You're going to hear me talk about this quite a bit. So those of you, you get used to it. <laughs> I've got two beautiful little girls. And uh, one of them is named Lily. And Lily was born with a very rare infant deformity. And uh, uh, it's actually it was a good thing that she got born with this version of the deformity. Because the other two deformities are, are pretty, pretty... To use a word from my generation, gnarly. Some some of these kids are born without backbones and without two hips. But Lily was born with the most rarest form of it, and she was just born without one single hip. And because of this, um, the doctors told us that uh, Lily would never walk. <laughs> Have you met my Lily yet? <laughs> if you could catch her. <laughs> there, there are days. Where I just let Lily go nuts on purpose. I just I just let her bounce off the wall and ride her bike like crazy. Because when I look at her little miracle life, I go, Praise be to the God that controls everything. Amen. Hey Lynn, I'm, I love this girl right here. Yeah. About two years ago, she had a migraine. That was worse than anything she'd ever had before. And so we went to the emergency room and got some CAT scans and MRIs done. And ended up finding out that she had some poor eyesight, which we got reading glasses, right? And allergies. Yeah, got some medicine for the allergies. And everything was good. But part of that was that they took an MRI. And when they took that MRI, um, I just remember the doctor went out and consulted with the nurse, something, I don't know. He came back in and he pulled us together and he said, I got some news that I got to tell you. Your, your, your daughter has a tumor that's located in an inoperable location. 
And uh, he goes, and this is the worst. He goes, and I'm not a specialist, so I don't have any answers to any of your questions. No, oh, gee. Because I went, well, how do I take care of it? What do I do? I mean, do I give her breakfast or do I hold her back? I mean, I didn't know what to do. I mean, <laughs> everything came out at that point. He's like, go to a specialist. So we did. Went to Iowa City and went to the president of the neurological surgery. And he looked at her, her case and he said, I've seen three of these 75-year-old men. He goes, I've seen three of these in the entirety of my life. And uh, I'm going to take your daughter's case on specifically. And so I went, praise God. Um, he said, let's start praying now that it never grows. Because if it does, we got some problems. I also have the skin disease problem. I'm, I don't have leprosy, you can shake my hand. <laughs> uh, it's just inverse psoriasis, it's gross. It's, it's an internal thing, overactive red blood cells. So I was at a, at a doctor's appointment the same day we learned all this about her. And I was sitting in my skin, what do they call it, skin doctor? Uh, Dermatologist. What is it? Dermatologist. Dermatologist. I don't know why I couldn't think of that this week. I was like, I'm going to just say skin doctor. I was sitting at my dermatologist appointment, and this lady sits right next to me. She comes in, I saw her, she sits right next to me. There's all these open chairs, kind of like today's service. <laughs> There's all this open chairs. And she sits right there. And I'm kind of going, <laughs> got my got my sports <laughs> and I'm pretending to read it because really I'm just soaking in everything that I just heard. And this lady taps me on the shoulder and kind of give her my one eye and she goes, you know, the Holy Spirit told me to sit by you. And I went, oh yeah? She got both eyes at that point. <laughs> and so, tell me what this Holy Spirit said. And she goes, well, he just, he told me to tell you your daughter's going to be fine. At this point, I'm going, who are you? <laughs> and she goes, I had a tumor when I was nine years old that the doctors were able to get. It's the same tumor your daughter has. She's going to be fine. And I looked at her, and tears are gushing out of my eyes. And I'm going, oh, I love my God. <laughs> Because I am reminded that there is nothing beyond his grip. I didn't know that lady. I'd never seen her again. I just know in that moment I needed her to sit there and encourage me. And every time I see this girl pumped full of that iodine stuff and I have to go through an MRI twice a year, and God's got her brain in his hand. And to God be the glory in all circumstances of life. Be amazed at what he's doing through your life. Be amazed at what he can do through a darkened moment. Praise him in the storm as the song goes. Have faith. Have faith to know he is bigger. Amen? Amen. Jesus, I thank you for this day. I don't know if anything was spoken, but I, I just pray that if my words were spoken, let them fall to the ground. But Lord, if your words were spoken, let them be heard. And bring nourishment to every heart that's here. Help them, Jesus, to, to know you as a very real God. That, that does things like sends a random stranger to call out the exact tumor location my daughter has. She doesn't even know me. She just knows you. You are the God of all that. You're the God that calms the storm. And so Jesus, as the storms will rage in our lives, would you encourage us to keep our eyes focused on you? Stay in the boat. To tarry on. To run to the fight. Stand up strong. Because you are in the battle. You are our greatest weapon. And it's in you today I pledge my faith. I love you. I need you. It's in your holy, precious name that we pray. Amen. Have a wonderful week.